Great. Well, thanks everybody for, for coming today to this session. We're going to be talking about um, how to reduce or avoid author's fees when you're publishing open access. Um, my name's Didi. I'm a science librarian here at the university, and I'm also uh, partially responsible for an area we call scholarly communication, which is really kind of library jargon, but I'll explain it a little bit because it might be uh, relevant to what I'm talking about today. This is uh, a sort of an umbrella term that talks about all of those issues surrounding um, authors or researchers, scholars, how they communicate with each other about their research. And one of the big issues under that umbrella is open access. And it's an issue that I've sort of specialized in over the years. So that's why I have this piece under my assignment as well. Um, you may not all be aware, but as a librarian, um, we're faculty here at the university, and so that means we have research programs of our own. And so open access and scholarly communication are my research program. So I speak to you as a, as a librarian who values um, access to information today, but I also speak to you as a researcher and fellow author who has made all of my own research publications open access too. So I have sort of the practical experience to guide you and sort of help you through this, this process as well as the more librarian experience, I guess, in understanding that sort of the, the environment or ecosystem of publishing and scholarly communications. Okay, I think a few more people have joined, so I'm gonna add the, the link to the slides here. It's not that I expect you to follow along, but to say ours is a resource because there's going to be lots and lots of different links in these slides so that you can go back and follow the links to the different resources I'll mention. Okay, so I am recording the session. So those who've just joined, if you don't want to be part of the recording, please just put any questions or comments in the chat. Great, so I will pause every now and then to answer any questions I see in the chat, but otherwise I'll just continue on. Let's see. There. So I've made all these slides available in Google Slides, and I don't intend to take them down anytime soon, so they should all be there. And they're Creative Commons licensed. So um, thank you all for filling out the, the pre-assessment survey. That was helpful for me to see because it affirmed what I suspected, which is what you want a practical session on how to avoid these fees. And so that's what we're going to get. Really super practical. But before we can get into some of those practical tips and strategies, I um, need to provide some context. I'm sure all of you are um, somewhat familiar with open access, but we do need to sort of make sure we're on the same page. So I'll briefly talk about that. And then some of the, the routes to open access and the journal models, because I'll we'll be talking about those things repeatedly in the practical part. Okay, and so there's there's really two main routes, and you've probably heard this jargon already, so that's why I use it. You'll encounter this jargon quite a lot, so that's it's important to explain it. Um, so the gold route is probably the route most people are familiar with. That's publishing in an open access journal, basically. Um, I'll get into all of the different options under that route for how to try and avoid some of these fees. Um, and then this, the second route is the green route, which most people aren't familiar with. And this is actually the free route, always free. And this is via repository. So you still publish in a typical journal and post a manuscript in a repository. So we'll talk about that too. Okay, so let's get into that first part about the, the context. So open access is really a simple concept, um, big picture wise anyway. It's, it, we're really talking about scholarly literature for one thing. And that's not to say that other things, other types of content or creations can't be freely available as well. Certainly they can be. The reason why we focus on the scholarly literature in this topic is because um, this literature is generally freely given to publishers, um, if we're talking about the journal literature specifically. Authors aren't being paid for these articles that they submit, right? And, and they're often funded by the taxpayers, funded by public research dollars, and they often hold publicly funded positions at universities or research institutes as well. So the research is already being paid for 
Um, and so it should ethically be available to those taxpayers who pay for it, which is kind of the, the ethical argument um, behind open access. But anyway, that's, that's why we focus on this, the scholarly literature. Um, so the o open access relies on the internet. It means it, this couldn't be possible without the internet. So um, open access literature is online. Um, the only restriction really is somebody's access to a computer and the internet. And so that's still an issue places in the world for sure. Um, we, we can't address that here today or, or open access advocates can't really address that so much, but we focus on as long as people have access to a computer and the internet, they should be able to access the literature is the idea. Um, so th those people who are accessing the literature, the readers, they will never have to pay. They will never encounter a paywall. So in typical subscription journals, readers or libraries on their behalf, pay subscriptions. Um, if you don't have access and you encounter a paywall, you're asked to pay for that individual article, maybe 40 or $50 or whatever. I'm sure you've seen those. Um, while you're affiliated with the university, never pay those. You can get that, those articles for free through interlibrary loan. So I'll just mention, make sure you know that. Um, it may take a day or two, depending on where we get it from. So anyway, free of charge to readers. I have that in parentheses because sometimes, maybe often, authors might need to pay. So there's still costs, costs to publishing, right, that need to be paid somehow. Typically, in the typical system, it has been libraries or readers that pay. In this new system, some, some or most um, journals or publishers have transferred that cost to authors. And so not, authors are now getting a window into the costs or the, let's say, the prices. Uh, there's a big difference there of scholarly literature. Okay, so we'll, we'll get into that a bit more later. So, but you don't always have to pay as authors, which is what this whole session is about, right? So uh, the one final point I'll make is about copyright. There is still copyright on open access works. Typically, it will reside with the authors, which is nice. You can retain control of your copyright, which is what you would want to do, I would think, as an author. All this hard work you've done in research and you're publishing, you want to maintain control of it. But typically, in um, typical conventional publishing, the, the publisher wants you to transfer all of those copyrights to them. You don't have to do that for them to publish. They want to have that power and make that profit off your work, essentially. Um, typically, in open access literature, the, the um, copyright resides with the author, and you will be asked to um, to apply a Creative Commons license, like, like I did to this presentation, for example. And that um, is an indication to the readers, the users of that article, what they are permitted to do with it. So it doesn't mean that you have no copyright. It, it means that um, you are retaining certain rights and giving away other rights. So open access advocates prefer there to be minimal copyright. So you'll often see that Creative Commons by BY. And that just means attribution, right? Which is what we want to do anyway as um, ethical scholars. We want to attribute our sources. Otherwise, you can freely use that work that has a CC BY license. Distribute it, build upon it, etc. So that's the ideal situation. But there's many other Creative Commons licenses you could choose from as an author. OK, um, so that's a really brief introduction to like um, what it is and I hope we're kind of all on the same page now because it does get more complicated in the details which is what we're going to get into now. Okay I don't see any questions yet so I'll go on. I think again I'm not going to get into too much detail but we all know there's lots of benefits. Some of these are pretty obvious um, to making your research openly available meaning that like readers, anybody out there, users of any kind will find your work and will not encounter a paywall like they would in the typical conventional subscription system. So this means that all sorts of different types of people that we might not think about initially would be interested in our work can now access it, maybe implement it, um, influence public policy like government workers, practitioners, 
probably this is very applicable to many of you in the health sciences. Practitioners in the field can actually read your findings and apply them in their research or in their um, practice setting. Researchers in developing countries, of course, um, they don't have the privilege that we have of having really well-funded libraries. They often don't have any access um, and they have to rely on charity from publishers, basically. Um, so all of these different types of people can access your work, build upon it. It means more exposure and then higher citation rates. Essentially, this is called the open access citation effect. And there's a big area of research looking into this and in different disciplines, if it can be substantiated or not. Generally, the, the findings are that, yes, there is an effect. People will debate, but um, generally that's a finding. Uh, what else can I say? And uh, as you're well aware in the health sciences, there the tri-agency, the CIHR of the tri-agency has uh, a mandate. If you're CIHR funded, you must make your peer-reviewed publications open access within 12 months of publication. Um, and actually some other health health um, funders have that requirement as well. Some, some of the charity funders, I think. Okay, so we all know the benefits. No need to get too far into that. Um, <clears throat> basically to summarize, you know, um, there's three main benefits overall, and that is really to accelerate research. This is the perfect example is the past few years with the COVID um, research. Like we were, we, researchers, not me, um, were able to develop vaccines and treatments much more quickly because um, data was shared openly, freely, and the, the knowledge and the research was able to progress much more quickly because of that. Sure, we can, we can talk about some challenges um, another time maybe to that problem, but the reality is like it will accelerate research if people can build upon it and access it. Um, and if we include people who are traditionally excluded. So people in the global south, for example, or in marginalized communities who generally cannot afford access. And, you know, for authors, this is important for their own, um, uh, let's say, reputation or advancement in their career, increases their vis visibility, readership, and therefore their citations, impact factor, or let's say H index, I guess, that type of thing. Um, so always a good thing for authors too. Okay, pausing to look for questions. So there are two main routes. I briefly talked about this already, um, but we'll go into a bit more detail now. So the two main routes I'll talk about today are the gold route, which people are most familiar with. This is an open access journal. So you basically you publish in an open access journal. Sometimes these are hybrid journals, which I'll explain in a minute. Sometimes there's a fee. Probably many people say there's always a fee. But, um, actually, that's not true. Uh, probably in your area it might be, but it's not true over all the disciplines. Um, final version of record. So this is the version of the article that has the publisher's branding, typesetting, pagination, all of that. That's the version that's freely available at the time of publication. So that's the gold route. The next route is that green route that many people aren't familiar with. And so you can publish in that conventional subscription journal behind a paywall, right? Usually there's no fee um, for authors. Then you can self-archive a copy. And so usually this is that author's accepted manuscript, the AAM, sometimes called postprint of the paper. And that's the version after peer review and final revisions and all of that. So it's the same content of as that final version of record. It just doesn't have the same sort of branding of the publisher, right? You can post that typically in a repository for free. So you don't need to pay a fee at all. Um, sometimes, often, there is embargo period. So publishers want to make money still. So they figure they have to um, impose this embargo period. And the tri-agency says this can be more, no more than 12 months. OK. So let's talk about journal models before we get into some of the more, more of those details, right? So we have that conventional subscription model, right? This is that closed model uh, reader or the library on their behalf 
pays for access. Typically, the author doesn't pay, although we know authors, even in the conventional system, sometimes pay page charges or color charges, right? Um, that made a lot more sense in the print days, but now that most, most journals are online only, it doesn't make a lot of sense because there aren't extra charges in paper or ink for pages or color figures. Um, publishers are just addicted to these extra fees they get, I think. Anyway, uh, then there's this hybrid model. So I mentioned that briefly already. What that means is that these conventional journals are now making an option available to authors. So if you do want to make your individual author or article available open access, you can, but you'll pay a fee. You'll pay a very high fee. These are the highest fees. Um, but the reader and the library will still pay to access the complete subscription, right? Maybe not your particular article because you've paid to have that openly available, but the library is still paying a subscription to the entire journal. Um, and so libraries have always complained about this. We call it double dipping. It's unethical, we think. Uh, and so some of these publishers are responding to that now, and that's why we have some discounts on these fees for authors. So, okay. Uh, anyway, I, you can probably tell I have a lot to say about that, but I'll just go on. Um, so the gold OA model, then again, it's that gold publishing, the final version is available for free, various funding models. So some journals, many require authors to pay that article processing charge, and that's what we're here today to talk about, so how to avoid those high fees. Some journals don't, though, and these are known as diamond or platinum journals. Okay, so let's talk some more about these diamond journals. This is the model that I prefer of all of these. Um, so they are considered still confusingly gold journals, but they're called sort of platinum or diamond because they don't charge readers or authors. So neither of those groups pay. And like we said, like the final version of record is available open access at the time of publication. So how are these publication costs being paid then? There, there's various different ways and if you're interested, you can follow those links there. S2O means subscribe to open, OACIP, Open Access Community Investment Program, I think, uh, something like that. Anyway, so these are just two examples. These are ways of community funding. Uh, the second one is like a community funding almost. It's, it's again, it's libraries um, investing in these journals. And once the journals get their funding target, then they're able to be diamond OA and um, authors don't have to pay and neither do other readers or other libraries if they don't fund it. And subscribe to open is, well, I don't, I don't need to get too much into that. That's beyond the scope of today, but it's another model again that libraries support to fund. So there's ways to fund these sorts of initiatives. Um, what I'll say is that it, this, these sorts of funding models will only take in reasonable costs of publishing. They're not going to necessarily fund a really highly profitable journal because they're not feeding into the profit of these journals. They're feeding into the costs of publishing, right? If that makes sense. Okay, so how do we find some of these practically? on some of these journals. The best way I can recommend is this directory of open access journals. You might've heard of it, DOAJ. This is a quality controlled um, list of gold open access journals. So it really relies on the journal editors themselves to submit an application. So it's, unfortunately it's not comprehensive because of that. So if you come across a, a journal that's not in this list, um, it, it, it may still be a reputable journal, it's just that the editors haven't taken the time to submit an application because it's quite a rigorous application. They're trying to make this a really quality list, right? So you can trust the journals on this list are not scams or predatory or something, right? Um, so many, many of these journals on this list, you'll see 12,700. This is actually increased by over 100 since I took this screenshot, um, are diamond meaning they have no APCs, article processing charges for authors. And this is out of the 18,000 or so you can see, which has now 
surpassed 19,000 a couple days ago. So there's 19,000 or so journals in this list. Um, I won't spend the time to go out and do a demonstration of how to use this site, but I just took a few screenshots just to demonstrate how you might um, search for a journal on a particular topic area like geology. So I type in geology and there's 235 index journals at that time. And so if I want to find of those 235, which ones are without article processing charges, I check that box and there's 147, right? So then you scroll down, you get a list of those. So that's one method for finding some of these diamond journals that have no fees. Okay. Um, I might just mention here this um, OA Diamond Journal study. This is a really large scale um, study that's been funded by um, Science Europe and Coalition S, which is a big group of funders in Europe, research funders. Uh, and one of the main findings of this study uh, in, back in 2021 was an uh, estimated 29,000 or so journals out there that are Diamond OA journals. Uh, so there's lots and lots of these journals out there that actually don't charge fees to authors. Um, only a third of them are registered in DOHA. So just like I said, like a lot of them are kind of, um, they're small. They're, they're run by scholars. They're scholar-led, mission-driven. They don't have a lot of um, resources to fund staff. So probably the editors just haven't had a chance to fill out the application for DOHA, that kind of thing. Um, the reason why we have this impression that many journals out there charge APCs um, is actually because even though there's fewer of those, they actually publish more papers. They're more well-known journals. They get more submissions. They publish more. Um, they're, they're highly profitable. So anyway, you, you can have a look at this, some of this yourself if you're interested. Um, Diamond journals certainly are, are very much more diverse in language and in geographic representation as well. They're smaller, so they generally publish fewer articles a year because they're scholar-led. They don't have a lot of resources. So that's sort of an introduction to uh, the Diamond journals. What I think some of you might be thinking, if I haven't heard of these journals, I'm not familiar with them. I don't know if I should trust my work in them. And I think that's really entirely reasonable. And you should definitely assess any unfamiliar journals. One good way is to see if they are in, in the directory of open access journals, because they have gone through a process to get included. Um, if they're not in there, it doesn't mean that they're not um, legitimate. It just means that they're not in there, right? And so you need to do further assessment. So you don't want to get caught up in one of these predatory things. Again, though, being a diamond journal, they're not charging you a fee. So they're, they have no incentive to be predatory. You know, the, the predatory ones charge a fee and that's why they're there is to get your money. But anyway, you do want to steer, steer clear of them. I'm doing a session tomorrow. If you're interested, you can um, register for that and we'll talk more about how to avoid some of these predatory journals. Okay, so we want to talk about that gold route that everybody's more familiar with, um, where you actually have to pay an APC, an article processing charge. How to avoid these, or at least reduce them. Okay, so we have some discounts. So remember I said, because the library subscribes to lots of these journal collections um, from publishers, they are now offering us um, article processing charge discounts to our authors. So typically, like I said, these are those hybrid journals where you get to choose as an author to make your individual article open access. And then you pay a high, high fee. These are usually three to $5,000 per article. And that's because these are profit-driven journals. They want to make money. Um, generally, gold open access journals that aren't hybrid aren't that much. OK, so what are some examples? Of these discounts, we have Canadian Science Publishing, 25%, Elsevier, 20%, Sage Gold. Um, so that's the gold, that's not the hybrid, 40%. So, you know, you get an idea like this is this is the amount. <laughs> yeah. yeah, somebody just mentioned in the chat that Elsevier owns the world. Elsevier is the largest scholarly publisher and they make more profit than Apple. Be 
because they don't have to pay for the content or the quality control. Anyway, that's a topic for another day. We can get into that another day. Uh, let's see. So the memberships, sometimes we pay for memberships. So Springer Open, Biomed Central, they're kind of a, a combination nowadays. Um, if you publish with them because you're USASC affiliated, you'll get 15% off. So that's a, a membership more than a um, uh, discount, I guess. So those are examples of those. And now we have what I'll call waivers, and they're not exactly waivers, but it means basically that you, as a USASC author, do not need to pay. And again, this is because we've subscribed as a library to some of these big deal journal collections, but the publishers are now offering a new model. So we're not just paying for the subscription so that we can read their content. We're also paying on behalf of our authors to publish, if that makes sense. These are called read and publish or transformative agreements. You might hear those terms. Okay, um, so these again are typically hybrid journals, but they could also be gold journals. Um, but the library is paying for this and it's a really new model. So we're kind of experimenting and seeing how this goes. Um, there's a lot of div um, diversity, I don't know is the right word, but there's a lot of um, stuff going on in this area right now with these new models and they're trying to figure out how to fund open access basically. So it's not exactly a waiver, but for you as an author, it is. These are some examples of those deals that we have right now. So Cambridge is a big one and so is Sage and Royal Society and then some smaller ones too. So these are on a limited time period, like you would, um, like we would have for the typical subscription, you know, we have vendors subscriptions for, I don't know, a limited time, like two to five years or whatever. And so these are the same. So you might be wondering, how can you find out all the details? I, I maintain this guide, this, um, this link, it goes out to the page on this open access research guide that I maintain all the details of these various waivers and discounts. So that's where you'll find the most up-to-date information and some of the um, details, because usually it's um, the corresponding author's institution that receives this or that um, qualifies for this. So if you are uh, collaborating with somebody at another institution, um, depends on who, who the corresponding author is and if that institution that they belong to has this discount or waiver. So keep that in mind as you're choosing your author order maybe. We've already heard that this is influencing author orders out there on papers. Okay, so that was the gold, the gold publishing route. Um, now just pause here in case there's any questions before we go on to the green route. Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing any, that's fine. And uh, the green route, again, I think this is what most people are unfamiliar with. And so I want to spend a bit of time explaining this because I think this is an underused route. Um, it is free, it's free. Um, unless you're publishing in one of those gold journals, um, then that's sort of, but anyway, like if you're publishing in a conventional journal, this is, this is a free way you can make that manuscript openly available. And um, it complies with the tri-agency policy too, and most other funders too. Okay, so this is a reminder of those two routes. So we already just talked about this route, this gold route. So now we're going over to this green route. And so as a reminder, we're publishing in a conventional journal behind a paywall, no fee usually. Um, what we want to do is self-archive a copy. So that means you as the author have one more step in your publication process. You put a copy of that article in a repository. And this is free, right? Usually it's a particular version, which we'll talk about in a minute. And often there's an embargo, which we'll talk about. Okay. So kind of a complicated looking um, diagram, but we've already talked about most of this. These are the different versions of your paper, right? So that preprint or submitted version, what you submit to a journal, right? So this is the one before peer review, it goes through peer review, edits, uh, revisions, etc. It gets accepted. That's the author's accepted manuscript or the postprint, different terms. Um, 
some disciplines will call this whole area a preprint, um, but we make these distinctions because repositories, um, because of this route to open access. So this is the accepted version. Generally, at this point, the publisher is asking you to sign their copyright transfer agreement, which you uh, can negotiate. Let me mention that again. <laughs> anyway, once you've done that, then the publisher-owned version is the version of record. And that's the one we're typically familiar with, with the um, pagination and the branding and all of that, right? Uh, so this post-print version, author's accepted manuscript, is typically the version that you would self-archive in a repository. Okay, so there's several things you need to be aware of. And usually this is in the journal's policy or the publisher's policy on self-archiving. So you can find it on their website, typically. Um, so when can you post? We talked about this embargo period. Typically, publishers are wanting you to um, wait six to 12 or sometimes even longer months. And that's because they think that they're going to lose profit if people are going to cancel their subscriptions, if everything out there is free, right? Um, I'll talk about ResearchGate in a couple minutes. I just see in a, a question about that in the chat. So hang on, I'll talk about that soon. Um, so where can you post? Usually non-commercial repositories. Uh, so that means your institutional repository or one of those um, preprint repositories out there, which I'll mention soon too. So what do they mean non-commercial? So at a university, we're non-commercial, we're publicly funded. Commercial repositories, I say repositories in quotation marks because they're not exactly, are things like ResearchGate. Somebody's just mentioned that in the chat. ResearchGate isn't a repository. Um, some people may think it is, but it's it's commercial too. And so actually you, you typically can't post. There are some exceptions to that. Uh, okay, so what version can you post? We mentioned that already. Usually the post print uh, author's accepted manuscript. Other requirements, there may be a few, like this will all be in your um, copyright transfer agreement. Usually reasonably the publisher wants you to link out to the version of record in case anybody wants to see what the final version looks like. Um, so like I said, this is in your copyright transfer agreement that you've um, signed with the publisher. You can negotiate that. So if the publisher says, um, yes, you can self-archive, but the embargo period is, I don't know, 24 months, two years, right? You are funded by the tri-agency. You need to make your, your article available within 12 months. You can negotiate with that publisher. They're aware of these funder requirements and they will typically, well, I've heard of this anyway, they might have a secondary transfer agreement, copyright transfer agreement, in case an author um, questions this particular term, okay? So tell them what your requirements are. You can negotiate these things. Um, and what I would say is it's best before you even submit to the journal to look at their um, their policies in this area. So you know you need to comply with the tri-agency policy. If they're if the journal's policy is 24 months, then um, sorry, <laughs> you don't want to submit to them. Or you want to maybe um, reach out to the editor in advance and say and tell them you're you're required to post within 12 months. I'm sure they will change their not change their policy, but adapt it for you. Anyway, what what many people will say is I don't know what that copyright transfer agreement looks like anymore. I've, you know, stored it away or I just clicked a box on a website. I don't know what it says. So you can actually go to Sherpa Romeo. This is um, a tool, an online tool, like you can um, put in your journal name or the publisher name and search for their policy. So their typical policy, like the uh, copyright transfer agreement, if you negotiated it might be different, but typically it's what the policy on their website will say and it will be listed under this Sherpa Romeo tool. I'll pause because I think there's some questions that are coming in. Oh, what is the question to negotiate in the, in agree, in the agreement? What is the phrase you would do for that? Um, for negotiating the embargo, I think you're asking. Uh, so, I mean, you can put it in your own words. I, I'm sure they'll understand, but if you talk about the embargo, I need to um, comply with a particular funder's 
policy to post within 12 months in a repository, they will understand that you're talking about the embargo period. Uh, the actual wording will differ from publisher to publisher, but typically it, it's called embargo, so that's what the term you should use. Are the repositories searchable for someone that is uh, conducting a review, for example? Um, typically, typically. So most institutions like uh, universities like ourselves will have something called an institutional repository nowadays. We have one called Harvest, which I'll speak about shortly. Um, as long as the, the staff running these repositories have optimized them for search engines, which we have at Harvest, they will be searchable by Google, Google Scholar. So they will show up in Google Scholar searches. Often people think, um, well, we, people won't be able to find my work because they won't know it's in such and such a repository that they have to go to Harvest to search. I mean, that's one way you could do it, but most people just search Google and it will direct you to the repository. Okay, so as long as the repository is search engine optimized, SEO, um, they and most of them are, I think, nowadays. So good question though. So I know there's lots of stuff we're talking about here and it can seem complicated. I don't expect you to remember all of these things and we can help. I mean, this is part of the scholarly communications that I've specialized in, so I can help. We have a repository manager now for Harvest that can help. Uh, we can guide you through the process. Once you've done it once or twice, it's really not as complicated as it seems. Okay, so please don't fear. This is uh, this is Harvest, link to Harvest. Um, if you have an NSID and password, you it may seem like you can log in and just deposit, but you won't actually be able to deposit in a collection. We have it organized by collections, usually by schools or colleges, departments, that kind of thing. And so you need to be approved to deposit in a particular department or school, right? Um, so you need to email this harvest email just to be approved for a particular collection. And then there's some instructions on the site for how to do this. And we can walk you, th walk you through that the first time, that's fine. Okay, questions at this point? Okay, so there is another session on Friday about Harvest, and this is run by our repository coordinator, a staff member that's organizing, or a uh, full-time staff member that we have working on Harvest right now. So she will run that session on Friday. If you're interested, you can sign up for that same time, noon, noon to one. Okay, so you may say, well, I'm not particularly interested in um, posting my things to the institutional repository because I may be moving soon to another institution. I, you know, there's lots of subject repositories out there too, which you may find suit your interests more. So how do you find some of these other repositories out there? There's a directory, like there is a directory of open access journals. There's a directory of open access repositories. Again, quality controlled. Um, so you can search through this or browse by country, look for a repository name if you know it, or just search by subject or topic, I guess. So that's one option to find other types of repositories out there. Uh, preprint repositories. So I mentioned this briefly. You've probably seen some news about all these different preprint repositories. Again, subject-based usually. And I say preprint in those scare quotes because what people consider preprint may be just anything, anything before the final version, which is a, a bit different than what I'm talking about today. Um, but it really depends on the particular repository and how they've uh, classified, I guess, what sorts of documents they will accept. So good to check with the particular repository of interest first, what they will accept. Um, some of them will just say anything that um, you are legally allowed to share. So you must have the copyright, the ability to share the things. So um, the archive, that's the ARXIV, uh, is a really well-known, well-successful, long-running physics repository. Uh, um, and so that's been around for decades. Uh, and so many of these other repositories you can see have kind of played on that term. Lots and lots out there. So you can either search in the open door directory or ask around colleagues. Um, you may find one for your area. Okay, so somebody asked about ResearchGate. 
or your own website. Can I post on my departmental homepage? Can I post on my own website? Sure, sure you can. This will again be in your copyright transfer agreement, what you're allowed to do. And generally that is more um, the parameters or the, uh, yeah, the parameters I guess for that are more li liberal, let's say. There's usually often not an embargo period, you can post immediately. And I think that's because publishers are really aware that uh, personal websites, departmental websites are not generally search engine optimized in the same way as institutional repositories. They're not generally preserved or updated. They generally, you know, kind of languish a bit. And, and so people don't find them as easily is what I'm saying. And so they're not as threatened. Publishers aren't as threatened by personal websites or departmental websites as they are by repositories. So they don't put as many qualifications, I guess, on that. But yeah, you can you can generally do that. ResearchGate, like I said, is a commercial, commercial repository, or not repository so much, but a commercial entity. So you want to ensure long-term preservation, accessibility, meaning people, readers can access, and discoverability. So someone asked about, um, is it searchable? So discoverability, library jargon, but means like people on online can find your article. So all of these things are what repositories do, especially ones at institutions that are run by libraries. This is what the sort of thing libraries specialize in is long-term preservation of information, making it accessible, making it discoverable. So, um, even if your article is already open access through the journal, you may still want to post a copy in a repository just because. Uh, that's just what I do, just to have a second copy out there. Anyway, why not? Why am I saying don't post in ResearchGate? Or you, you can if you want. I mean, if you're able to. Um, your publisher doesn't typically allow posting in commercial repositories, like I said. So that includes academia.edu. Check with your copyright agreement, journal policies, et cetera, or strip your Romeo, like I said, because um, there are some journals that have um, uh, agreements with ResearchGate right now. So anyway, um, the other reason is if you're trying to comply with a policy, an open access policy from the tri-agency, for example, they won't consider this as complying for the reasons I've, I've mentioned. It's not enabling long-term preservation, accessibility, or discoverability. I mean, right now it may be accessible and uh, discoverable, but we don't know um, the future of something like ResearchGate because it's a private entity uh, and a commercial entity. They could close the doors at any time and your article's not there anymore, right? So it's no longer accessible or discoverable, preserved. So that's that's the, the issue here. It's not that you can't necessarily, unless your agreement tells you you can't, it's that uh, also, you may want to post in a repository as well. Is that clear? Um, any questions? Pause for a sec. Okay. So I, I should mention some final options as we're um, getting near the end. I, I put these near the end because, I mean, people are going to ask, you may be, remember that the Office of Vice President of Research here at the university used to have a publications fund. Um, and that was for all costs associated with publishing. It's been discontinued. Um, I have heard at various points that some colleges or schools might have their own funds. So you should ask your unit. I don't think it's very common, but again, it's a possibility that I should mention. The other thing I should mention is that OA fees if you do want to pay the article processing charges are generally an acceptable grant expense so you can budget them into your grant application i know people don't want to spend their grant monies that way especially in the in the sciences there's multiple different uh, publications that may come out of one grant and then that's a big expense so it is an option i should mention though uh, the final one again there's lots of fee-based gold journals out there that will waive fees if the author is from the Global South, unfunded, or you can demonstrate some financial need, um, they are aware that authors don't like paying these fees and they're losing some submissions because of it. So they're trying to comply and they're also trying to be um, sensitive to the equity issues from authors from the Global South. Uh, I 
don't like the author, those authors having to rely on charity. Uh, but anyway, it's 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 an option out there. Okay, so as you may tell by some of my comments, um, I have some thoughts on this. Uh, scholarly publishing is is very very profitable, as our comments about Elsevier mention. They they make a lot of money on this um, on this stuff. Um, the original advocates of open access um, did not intend to make inequities to authors. So um, most publishers now have see that open access is the future. They're transitioning their revenue stream to article processing charges, and they're charging authors unreasonable fees. Um, I will say that unreasonable fees. Uh, like they have been charging libraries unreasonable subscription prices. And it's just, that's been invisible to most most users. Um, libraries have been aware of it, of course, um, but now authors are becoming aware of this situation too. Basically, it's shifting the inequities in the system from readers to authors. It's not what OA advocates have ever envisioned. This is not what open access was about. Um, it's just, it's how the market is moving right now. So what is a reasonable article processing charge? Like I said before, there's costs to publishing, absolutely. But what are those true costs and what are the prices that the, the publisher is charging? Those are two different things, right? So um, that's why diamond, diamond journals are often um, kind of scholar-led and kind of working off the side of their desks. Um, so they, they can produce good quality work at a low cost, um, but they're not making any profit, of course. So this particular article did a very deep dive into the actual costs of publishing. And they found that um, costs range from about $200 US to about $1,000 US per article. Um, and that will really depend on how many submissions the article or the author, sorry, the journal gets, um, because of course, the more submissions you get, the more staffing you need to process those things. Um, and if, especially if you're having high rejection rates, so you're going through all those things and then rejecting them and only publishing a few things, uh, then your costs go up, of course. Um, but anyway, even, even, even in that range, the publication costs for a journal article today should lie around $400 US. That's a reasonable, cost to fund fund the um, the uh, the services you're receiving from that journal okay so we all know that there are lots higher prices than that and that's because those publishers are making profit even if it's a non-profit um, society publisher they're they're still getting lots of money to then reinvest in, in their society activities, basically. It's, they, they don't call it profit. Yeah, the average in my field is $3,500 US, someone says, and that's that's pretty typical in the health sciences, I think, and in sciences too, uh, unfortunately. And that that is because of, of this, this market and very profitable market for journals. Okay, so, Finishing up here, we have a bit of time for questions. I thought I'd just end with this this nice little book. It is a really little book, actually. It's it's a really succinct, but very authoritative. Peter Suber is um as an academic at Harvard. He's one of the original proponents or advocates, I guess, of the open access movement. He's kind of the de facto leader, if there was one. Uh, anyway, this book of of course, is openly available, as you'd expect, and in various formats. So I have a link there if you are interested. He goes in very um, clearly and succinctly, I think, no nonsense in it, in talking about all the issues around this. We also have a print copy, if you prefer, in the library. OK, so I'll I'll stop there and see if there's any any questions or comments. Again, there's a link to the open access research guide. There's um, various tabs on that guide. You can explore some of the other areas that I didn't have a chance to talk about, but there is that one page on discounts and waivers. And I keep that constantly updated as as these um as we get as we sign on to some of these agreements because they have terms and they they end and another one will begin, for example, and they have different details. So please do 
check in with that guide regularly. And that will give you some details. And if um, you have questions, certainly you can contact me or your, your own librarian. We have librarians for every subject area. And they will have more discipline-specific knowledge to answer your questions. <laughs>